Hey there, welcome to YouTube. If you are into poetry, if you are into literature, if you are into cultural history, then you've come to the right place. Cardboard Box Productions makes podcasts about all those things, so be sure to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Obviously, we mostly make podcasts, so you can also go to anywhere you get your podcasts, if it's a, a place other than YouTube, uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds there. All right, I hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and with my good friend Connor McNamara Stratton, we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare minute of your time, it would mean the world to us if you would give the podcast a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help boost us up the algorithm and find new listeners. And if you have suggestions for future episodes or comments on this one, you can send us an email at closetalkingpoetry at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn, and Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a website, closetalking.com, where you can find all the past episodes of the show, and Cardboard Box Productions has just launched a newsletter, Unboxed, and if you go to cardboardboxproductionsinc.com, you can subscribe for more behind-the-scenes stuff on Close Talking and all of the other literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. On with the show. Hello, and welcome to an all-new episode of Close Talking. I am Jack Rossiter Munley, here with Connor McNamara Stratton, and today we are discussing a poem. Our poem for today, which I selected, is Presque Isle by Louise Glick. And Louise Glick was born in 1943, and she is, I would say, one of the great living American poets. Um, she won the National Book Award, I think, 2015, I think, with um, her collection, Faithful and Virtuous Night. Um, and the poem, Presque Isle, is part of the collection, The Wild Iris, which came out in 1992 and won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a very interesting book, and I will read it. Presque Isle. In every life, there's a moment or two. In every life, a room somewhere, by the sea or in the mountains. On the table, a dish of apricots, pits in a white ashtray. Like all images, these were the conditions of a pact. On your cheek, tremor of sunlight, my finger pressing your lips. The walls blue white, paint from the low bureau flaking a little. That room must still exist on the fourth floor with a small balcony overlooking the ocean. A square white room, the top sheet pulled back over the edge of the bed. It hasn't dissolved back into nothing, into reality. Through the open window, sea air, smelling of iodine. Early morning, a man calling a small boy back from the water. That small boy, he would be 20 now. Around your face, rushes of damp hair streaked with auburn, muslin, flicker of silver. Heavy jar filled with white peonies. Uh, the first thing that I'm curious about in reading this poem is that there's just so much color in it. There's a lot of colors at the beginning, which are mainly about the room, and we're in the room for the beginning of the yeah, poem. Right. Blue and white, 
are the main colors, particularly white, that are pointed out. And then we go outside, and there's just an explosion of color in those last four lines, particularly the last two, and particularly the last one. And yeah. in those last two lines, you have auburn, muslin, silver, and white for the peonies. That's such a good observation, especially because it's such a poem rooted in memory. I mean, the whole thing is about a memory and this memory being important and the particular vividness that I think emerges at the end suggests perhaps how the, the memory by, by the end has like worked its way into being sort of a more vivid thing or something for, for the speaker. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I just, I love this poem. I say that about every poem, but I guess we're only talking about ones that we love. So, although maybe at some point we'll do one that we should we just pick one that's awful. And, and we want to bring good things into the lives of our listeners. We want these poems, not just for our own discussion, but also because they're great poems to know about. We yeah. want you to know about either the poem specifically, or in many cases, to know the poet who wrote it and their other work, because we really value what they're doing and we think you might get a lot out of it too. Yeah, I agree. And this one, this one I love, it's just so, it's about, it's a memory that the speaker has with this you who as seems to be like maybe a partner, like a romantic relationship um, that may or may not be still going on. Um, it's sort of unclear, but um, very important person. And it's this kind of intimate, very intimate moment that she's recalling. Um, and it's, it's maybe 15 years ago, there's that line, that small boy, he would be 20 now. So we have a sense if the boy is, you know, five or seven or something, um, this is like, you know, a dozen or 15 years later. Um, and what, what, what I love about it is, for one, the beginning, the first stanza is so interesting. It starts very removed. So we have, in every life, there's a moment or two. In every life, a room somewhere by the sea or in the mountains. Um, and this is, in every life, it's this kind of, we're just sort of thinking about the world. We're just like, you know, what's life like? blah, 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 and there's not much sense of like personal stake or personal investment. Um, and it also is not that clear, like in every life there's a moment or two, like a moment or two what? Like th that you like, that you hate, that you remember, that fucks you up. Um, it's not, it's just very suggestive. I mean, it's sort of that, that, um, restraint reminds me a little bit of the very beginning of the Red Wheelbarrow poem, the Williams, so much depends upon us Red Wheelbarrow. And it's like, what is this so much? I don't know. So, um, but then, at the, then after that, we move straight into, and this is what I really love, we move straight into items in the memory. And there's no two, two elements that, that, I think make this poem work is there's no I remember blah 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 or do you remember or like I saw in fact in the memory lines there are no actual verbs so um, on the table a dish of apricots hits in a white ashtray um, tremor of sunlight finger pressing your lips, not pressed your lips. So everything is happening in this very still, slow, motionless, fixed way. And, um, we get, and that really brings in the memory because it's almost like it's flashing in your mind. It feels very present, even though it is clearly not what's happening right now. It's that in comes one image and then it goes out and in comes another image and then it goes out. You don't linger on any one of them until the very end of the poem where you're getting to this sort of core image. 
you have this scene setting through these fleeting in and out visions of different objects or moments. You don't have any stillness. You have motion. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's just, it, for some reason it, it moves me in, like what I just, it strikes me because the first time I read it, when I got to the last line, I got that, that poem chill thing. And it was like heavy jar filled with white peonies. And I was like, why did I get that? Like when we talked about what the living do, the end is so, it's restrained, but it's clearly poignant. I am living, I remember you. Here, we're just returning to a description of an object. We have a jar with flowers in it. There's no like the flowers which represented the love who is no longer with me or something like that. That's, that's not there. And what I think has happened is a very quiet placement of images that A, bring you into the scene. So they're very vivid. I mean, these, these are, these are just clear as day pits in a white ashtray, um, paint from the low bureau flaking a little that flaking. Um, and, and the fact that the room it's, it's mostly objects that the memory is thinking about. Things are pieces of, of the room are coming into force. Um, and, and yet then within that, there's these more abstract moments that I think help us understand that this is important, even though we might not sure why not. So the beginning obviously helps in the moment, there's a moment or two. So we're like, this is one of the two moments in this person's life that gets them or something. And then, um, that room must still exist. And so it's that kind of, that phrase is very interesting, that room must still exist. It's like, yes, we're, this is still, that still must be there that I'm thinking about what, I don't know. Um, and then, which is, I think, resolved this line, which I love, it hasn't dissolved back into nothing, into reality. Um, and I love that A, because the pair, the closeness of into nothing, into reality, that, so it makes sense, obviously, because when, if the memory leaves, um, you know, it's not there, so it's nothing, but where does it go to where the room still exists into reality? That makes sense. But at the same time, it suggests the connection between reality and nothing. There's this kind of true value in the imaginary or the memory, I think for the speaker, that is important. Um, and it's still so restrained, it hasn't dissolved back, is a sort of like a negative way of articulating, I still remember this. Yeah, and then just the intimacy of the you on your cheek, tremor of sunlight, my finger pressing your lips, that's such an evocative image. Um, and, it, and yeah. And it brings another person into this room, yeah. which then adds depth to the room must still exist because that line, in addition to giving us the contours of the memory, also situates this as a memory. It starts bringing that distance from the events and the objects that are being relayed. And so the introduction of another person in relation to our narrator also heightens the emotions that must have gone into that room. It gives us a deeper sense of what that room might have meant before then not removing the room because the room must still exist, but removing us through the person telling us about the room. Yeah. Something about it. The one part that I'm curious to know what you think about this line, which I've been thinking about a lot. I don't, uh, understand it exactly, but like all images, these were the conditions of a pact. And then it's a colon, and then on your cheek, tremor of sunlight, my finger pressing your lips. And I'm trying to figure out A, what's the pact? B, 
be why what are the conditions that are being described and c how are all images conditions of packs i don't um and yet it seems so vital somehow that affects me still even if i don't understand it it's because that's it's making a claim both about these specific images but also it articulates in some ways i think a thesis of how, why the poem is what it is which is a series of images basically disconnected and like all images this is some kind of pact but i i am still mysterious to me <laughs> i wonder if you have any thoughts on that my thought would be i guess a possible reading of this poem would be that this room this special place because we're clearly indicating that it is a very special place the memory of it i think tinged with a certain sense of loss is a very fond one it is a unique space i think without going far beyond the text we could read this room as a place of young love of a special place in a young relationship the honeymoon phase of a relationship this is the room where these two young lovers went and had you know an idyllic weekend by the sea perhaps or something there's a table and a dish of apricots it's very sensually described quick images but that's a really you know rich apricots Ooh. you know it's, it is it's like you don't just have apricots around you're like no you have apples right you got apples or bananas or some lettuce or something like a dish of apricots and the pits and the white ashtray and ooh, what special sex times we got what uh, accent is that jack oh my god it's i don't know <laughs> it's like it's not yeah it's not an everyday food it's not an everyday description of the food like it is a sensual addition and i think what we can see is that maybe they didn't go back to that room but they did return to potentially this same beach later. That's another memory from this same space. Yeah, so the pact in that way is you and I in the poem are like, we'll be together, like are committing ourselves to each other kind of thing. As you said, it's just a pact of togetherness. It's a pact of care and devotion and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That especially makes sense in that those, the images that follow are so like on your cheek, tremor of sunlight, my finger pressing your lips. Those are, those are the most, except for maybe the last images, the most intimate with the you in the poem. Yeah, but I'm still, yeah, so that, that clears things up. Um, I do wonder, like all, the phrase like all images is still very interesting. And I think this is something that Glick does, which is why she's such a good poet, but also a little mysterious, is she can be very declarative about, like, like all images, these were conditions of a pact. It's like, you haven't backed up, like, I have no idea if I buy this claim, but yet here it is, and I'm sort of along for the ride. Um, in support of my perhaps slightly reductive potential <laughs> reading of this poem as just memories of two people together through life, yeah. perhaps that, like all images, is telling us how to read the poem forward. Every image of this is about that pact these two people made, and all these images are about the life they then went on to live together that cycled through this area not the room specifically because they reflect on the fact the room must be there on the fourth floor i can imagine them on the beach as the man child call as the man calls the child back our you know writer looks over at the hotel or the house that they stayed in and looks up at the fourth floor and thinks about the weekend they spent there yeah and the room must still be there but they're not seeing it you know do you think that the man and the child are related to the speaker or because I, I initially thought they were just like 
two random people that she saw. Um, if only because that small boy, he would be 20 now. It's like, if that's the speaker's child, that's like a really way to, like, unless she's estranged, like they got divorced and now has not seen her kid for a long time. Um, that would be an odd way of talking about it. And because with the man, there's so much second person, it seems odd that the speaker would then talk about the you as the man rather than you with the child or something. I, I think know. that's probably correct. I, I think it is that that last line then takes us back to the room that they're looking out and they see this man and child and then it sort of takes us back to these two people. I think that's probably a more correct reading. Because I, honestly, when I initially read the poem, I read that as this is a couple who lost a child remembering fonder times. Yeah, well, and that still could be in the poem. I mean, that still could be what's meant, but I, yeah, I'm not sure. It's, no, I, it's specifically I, I, I go with your reading 100%. I think that they there's probably two people together and they look out where they go out onto the beach and they see these two people and then they come back and they're, it's reflecting on the memory of that time of being young and just impressions of what's going on. Yeah. One other part that I think helps the stillness of the poem, along with the general lack of verbs in the memory sections is there are no enjambments at all. Frequently, sejuras are like multiple sentences within each line. And um, that really slows things down and keeps things very compact. So if you have a lot of enjambment, there's a lot of movement into the next line. There's a lot of bleeding in and that motion, but everything is very calm and com like compartmentalized almost. But getting to your point about the last line and why it sticks with you, that last line of the poem is two sentences in one line, and there's verbs in them. Yeah, although, well, they're, okay, so they're verbs. So when I said verbs initially, I meant like in the verb form. So like, uh, there's filled with white peonies, but it's not heavy jar fills peonies or something. That's all I meant. Right, it's not an action, really. It's describing. Yeah yeah. 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 But that is true. It has, um, it's also the sounds. So flicker of silver with muslin, there's the sort of I sounds in muslin and flick and sill. And then the ers in flicker and silver that move, I think, into the jar. Um, and filled has kind of muslin, those I sounds. And then white peonies is their kind of new sounds in that line that I think help it depart with vividness. Definitely. But it's also a different way of describing than like on the table, a dish of apricots. True. That's yeah. much more declarative than heavy jar. That's a description. We don't get any description of the table or the dish. The most we get about the ashtray is that it's white. Like this is a heavy jar. That's weight and it also signals that someone placed it down there's knowledge of its heft that's very different from a static white ashtray and filled with white peonies also indicates someone taking them and putting them in there that this jar did not always contain them whereas pits in a white ashtray or on the table a dish of apricots that could always have been there it's yeah. so static whereas this has implied emotion just circling all around it it's much more filled with potential that's yeah that is absolutely right implied motion is such a good phrase because those those uh, that's totally right and then also um around your face rushes of damp hair streaked with auburn flicker of silver the rush the streak the flicker those are all implied motion or you know verbs that have that or Verb forms. 
that has you just been... get you get the sense of more going on around what's being described than the simple mm -hmm. scene setting flashes that you get at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And part of that I think has to do with the fact that this other person has been introduced. And so we're playing off of that person a little bit, not just describing the room, which is our initial goal, but it also, I think, is in the service of accelerating this feeling that the poem is building to, which really does hit in that white peony line. Yeah, exactly. And I think it also echoes a little bit, which makes sense because that's the second person in the on your cheek tremor of sunlight. And I feel like tremor has that similar meaning as a flicker or the streak um, where there's like this like very short flash of something that is intense but minute and perhaps precarious. Um, and Yet at the same time, those are all sort of humming under the surface of this largely sort of very calm, composed poem where there's like, there's not much like tremor in the rhythm, you would say, or I would say. I agree. <laughs> you would also say. And I too shall say, yes, <laughs> verily, tis thus. Verily, verily. Do you have any other thoughts? I'm trying to think. I No, I don't think so. I yeah. think I am ready to hear it again. I think we got to hear it again. Marvelous. All right. And Presque Isle, I don't know where that is. I don't know. <laughs> is it in Maine? There is a Presque Isle in Maine. But then I was like, there's no ocean that you can see from Presque Isle from based on my Google search. This is not very pertinent, but there's also there's Presque, Presque Isle Park State Park in Pennsylvania. I looked that mm. up too, but no ocean there. Anyway, Glick, you must answer us. Glick. <laughs> this is, this is looking pretty oceanic. No, Presque Isle State Park. Oh, is it oceanic? No, it's an aerial view into a thin green peninsula arching into a long lake, a large lake. All right, it could be. It, it looks oceany. Okay. Ocean esque. Ocean esque. Ocean esque. Isle Presque. Presque Isle. In every life, there is a moment or two. In every life, a room somewhere by the sea or in the mountains. On the table, a dish of apricots, pits in a white ashtray. Like all images, these were the conditions of a pact. On your cheek, tremor of sunlight, my finger pressing your lips. The walls blue white, paint from the low bureau flaking a little. That room must still exist on the fourth floor with a small balcony overlooking the ocean. A square white room, the top sheet pulled back over the edge of the bed. It hasn't dissolved back into nothing, into reality. Through the open window, sea air, smelling of iodine. Early morning, a man calling a small boy back from the water. That small boy, he would be 20 now. Around your face, rushes of damp hair streaked with auburn. Muslin, flicker of silver. Heavy jar filled with white peonies. And that's our show. Another show? Why did I say show? It's it's a show. It's a show? All right. It's a show. Another great, successful show. This is co-host Jack Rossiter Munley. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. Five stars, maybe? Those reviews help with the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. And you can put anything in them. You can write whatever you want. You can just say, oh, this is a good podcast. I like this podcast. You could be like, hey, that kind of guy, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, Jack, why is he doing this outro so long? You know, get him off the mic. Whatever you feel like writing, head on over there. Five stars. Drop in the review. 
Uh, do you have thoughts about this poem? Is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? Well, we'd love to hear from you. And there are tons of ways that you can get in touch with us. I mean, I guess you could drop it into an iTunes review. You could be like, five stars. Hey, why don't you talk about insert name of poet here? Um, but you can also send us an email. That's probably the best way to do it. Close talking poetry at gmail.com is our email address. Or you can find us on Twitter. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. And the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, you can find us there too. Uh, we are at Close Talking Poetry. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash close talking. We haven't gotten to TikTok yet and we might never who knows anything is anything is possible um speaking of all those social media platforms a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager Corey china who keeps us active across the internet and a thank you to all of you for listening we will see you next time <laughs> <laughs>